Taylor Fritz is the king in California. He was once a top five player, and he's been flying the flag for American men's tennis since 2021. He also beat Rafael Nadal in the Indian Wells final in 2022, and we dared to dream that he could one day put an end to the Grand Slam drought in men's tennis in the United States. But it hasn't quite happened. Why is that? It's about time we talked about Taylor Fritz's tennis. So it's the Sunshine Double, and what better time to talk about some of our favorite Americans. Taylor Fritz being the best of the current crop gets him the nod. But something strikes me each time I imagine what tennis fans in general think of Taylor Fritz. Do you see him as likable and exciting to watch, or passive and boring? Or are you simply indifferent about him? We are going to be addressing every aspect of his game and some of the general narratives that fans have about Fritz. But let me first bring you up to speed with his career trajectory so far. Born into a family of athletes, Fritz was predestined for the sporting limelight. His mother, Kathy May, was a top 10 tennis player back in 1977, while his father, Guy Fritz, also competed professionally and was a tennis coach. As you would expect, Fritz picked up the racket at an early age. By the time he was in high school, he had already won a California Interscholastic Federation Championship. Fast forward to 2015 and our man Fritz was already the number one ranked boys junior player and ITF Junior World Champion at the age of 17. Oh, and he had also won the US Open Juniors. In doing so, Fritz was the first American to hold this title since Donald Young in 2005 and Andy Roddick before that in 2000. The stage was set and Fritz entered the ATP Tour later that year. But since then, it's been a story of ebbs and flows. Fritz broke into the top 250 the same year he turned pro, and there was more to come the following year. After reaching the final in Memphis in 2016, Fritz became the youngest American to reach an ATP final since Michael Chang in 1988, doing so in just his third career ATP tournament. He cracked the top 100 that same year and was on the brink of a top 50 entry, peaking at number 53 at just 18 years old. Only a handful of players have come anywhere close in the last decade, as we can see here. Although he did struggle the following year, Fritz finally broke into the top 50 in 2018, and he began to make deeper runs in tournaments. Come 2019, Fritz had actually bagged his first ATP title at the Eastburn International, and things were looking up. The growth and progress continued, and by 2021, Fritz had reached the semis at Indian Wells and was already the top-ranked American on tour. It was a foreshadowing of what was to come. The full circle moment for Fritz came in 2022 when we witnessed the unthinkable. He reached the second week of a Grand Slam for the first time in his career at the Australian Open, and he carried on with his fine form to the Indian Wells tournament, which he won against Rafael Nadal, snapping the Spaniard's 20-match winning streak, all while nursing an ankle injury. I mean, imagine winning your first Masters 1000 against a member of the Big Three on home soil and close to where you grew up. Nothing beats that feeling. It was the first time an American man won arguably the biggest non-Grand Slam tournament since Andre Agassi in 2001. Fritz would go on to beat Nadal again that year, while also giving the best players a run for their money, despite suffering from a foot injury that caused him to miss Madrid and Rome. With 45 tour-level wins that year, including 6 top 10 wins and 3 ATP titles, Fritz ended 2022 inside the top 10, and trust me, it was one of the most impressive top 10 breakthroughs we had seen in a while. He then picked up where he left off the following year, winning the United Cup and a couple of other titles to break into the top five. But what followed that was a couple of terrible losses and disappointments, like when he lost to world number 215 wildcard Shintaro Mochizuki as the defending champion at the Japan Open after being up a set and serving at 5-2 in the third for the match. It was then rinse and repeat in Basel when Fritz lost to world number 83 Alexander Shevchenko after wasting 15 breakpoint opportunities. And here we are now in 2024. Although Fritz has reached back-to-back -back quarterfinals at Grand Slams, defended his title in Delray Beach, and is playing some great tennis again, a lot of things have come to mind on what to expect of him, his gameplay, mentality, and many of the narratives that you guys might have about him. Unlike Felix Auger Aliassime and Holger Runa, who we also made deep dives about, Fritz's tennis isn't so straightforward, but I'll do my best to address all of the narratives, the good and the bad. Taylor Fritz is an awkward mover on the court, and it's part of what's preventing him from achieving more success. Well, first off, Fritz is a great player. I mean, his position in the ATP ranking already tells you that, but let's address his movement. Honestly speaking, we know that Fritz is not the most athletic player, and I wouldn't describe his movements as fluid, smooth, or even explosive. He lacks that natural quickness. We often see this with taller players though, and Fritz being 6 feet 5 inches tall, we can actually consider his movement to be average at best. When you think of a player like Daniil Medvedev, who has broken that mold by being taller and moving a lot better, 
it becomes easier to understand why some fans get frustrated by Fritz's relative lack of movement. It's also the same reason why closing points at the net frequently isn't really his forte. Verdict, agree. Fritz is a great player, but his movement, or the relative lack thereof, can be considered a major flaw in his game. And it becomes more obvious when he's on the back foot, which is why he isn't as successful on defense as he is on the offense. But the problem isn't just about his court coverage. Fritz's forehand doesn't do enough damage. It needs to be better. Let me respond to this by saying that Fritz's forehand is powerful and good enough to be an elite player. Although his forehand potency per match isn't as good as that of Carlos Alcaraz, Andre Rublev, Novak Djokovic, Kasper Ruud, and other top players like we can see from this data from Tennis Abstract, you can't point a finger to his forehand as a major problem in his game. Verdict? Slightly disagree. Could Fritz's forehand get a little faster and more consistent? Yes, of course. And although it isn't much of a problem for the most part, his lack of movement sort of amplifies the situation because he needs those forehands to be rockets, seeing that he needs to resort to an offensive game most of the time to get the better of his opponents. His rather extreme western grip isn't the prettiest either. It might be limiting at times, but Fritz has told us that the grip works for him and that it comes naturally to him. It's the same case with his take back. It is lower, and he usually has his elbow tucked into his body. With too much arm, forearm, wrist action, the very best players can draw out errors from his ground strokes when they put him under pressure. His technique isn't something your tennis coach is likely to recommend, but again, Fritz has shown that he can make the most of what he has, and besides, he's already improved his forehand a whole lot over the years, to the point where it's more reliable and consistent. So let's move on to other things. Fritz cannot slice to save his life. He's one-dimensional. One of the things that makes Novak Djokovic who he is is the fact that he can hurt you from anywhere and with anything. Essentially, the more weapons you have, the more backup to fall to when things aren't going your way. For Taylor Fritz, truth be told, he's just about the worst player when it comes to utilizing the slice on his backhand. This data from Tennis Abstract shows that Fritz only uses the shot 6.3% of the time. This means that for every 100 backhands that Fritz makes, he only slices the ball 6 out of the 100 times. Only Yannick Sinner has a worse stat in this category among the top players. Verdict? Slightly agree. Top players have won some of the biggest trophies and gotten away without slicing much. I mean, Yannick Sinner just won the Australian Open, and I'm not sure anyone really cared about him not slicing. So while Taylor Fritz isn't great at it, it won't matter much if the other parts of his game could cover up for this lack of variation. We're only talking about this because Fritz's game doesn't have the most variation technique-wise. What else have we got? Fritz always puts too much pressure and is always hard on himself, and that's prevented him from fully reaching his potential. When you look at Fritz's under pressure rating on the ATP leaderboard, you'll notice that he sits at a modest 29th position, which isn't terrible, but not where you want to be for a player who wants to beat the very best. I mean, take a look at the top 5 under pressure leaders. Fritz also falls particularly short when you consider that he's only won 47.6% of deciding sets in the last year. Compare those numbers with Sinner, who's on 81%, Medvedev on 71%, and Novak on almost 70%. Fritz has acknowledged that his mental health and happiness are tied to how well he's playing, which isn't exactly ideal. He tends to overanalyze things a lot. We've seen how hard he's been on himself, scolding himself and sulking especially after tough losses. Being the frontrunner of a crop of young American tennis players, Fritz has always had the weight of expectation on his shoulders, and it has weighed him down at times. When asked about how he was coping with all of it, Fritz said, quote, It was more about the pressure and expectations I put on myself, and I think, over time, that caused me to get away from the style I should play. It caused me to play safer, to be more passive. I was just too scared. I was scared to lose, and when you're scared to lose, then you just play not the way I want to play. I learned you just have to go after it. That's what I had to keep telling myself. If you're playing to win, you can't be scared to lose. That's the biggest thing I've been thinking about. And I found that I'm happier losing if I took my chances and the ball just wasn't going in, rather than thinking I lost because I wasn't taking chances. I was hoping the other guy would lose. In the past, Fritz admitted that he hated tennis, saying that becoming a tennis player was not part of his life objective. But with both parents already ex-tennis pros, the pressure came at a very young age for Taylor. Now, taking all of these into consideration, it becomes easier to understand why Fritz sometimes buckles under the pressure. Verdict? Agree. Albeit, Fritz is handling the pressure way better now, and it's something he has opened up about. I think I just can go about handling it better. And, and, I, and I, already, I already have. He also says that he really doesn't care anymore, and he feels like the spotlight isn't on only him anymore. Here's what he said in one of his interviews at the 2023 US Open. By the 20 year drought that doesn't weigh on your mind then uh it's a factor i mean you can't control i mean it. i don't i don't care like obviously i want to be the one that that ends it but so does you know so does francis so does tommy so does all the all the other americans you know that doesn't really change anything like i want 
that's I guess that's not on my mind. I want to win a slam, <laughs> and uh, in doing that, you know, then all the other stuff. But uh, it's it's not as much pressure as I guess you'd say like the Tin Henman thing because it's not it's not just me. There's 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 several of us, so we we share that and we share the uh, the hopes of it, I guess. But some groups of fans believe that Fritz actually doesn't have what it takes to dominate the tour, which leads us to the next point. I do think me winning Indian Wells, I was the first um, American in a while to to win uh, like a big a big title. So you know naturally people are going to start you know the next the next step is just winning a Grand Slam. Fritz has hit a ceiling. He'll never win a Slam. When you take a look at Fritz's game, it doesn't really bear any resemblance with Pete Sampras, Agassi, John McEnroe, or some of the other greats. He's probably closer or more in the mold of Andy Roddick, if you ask me. But Fritz is unique and has his own special talents. While I understand that us American tennis fans really hope to end a Grand Slam drought that's lasted over 20 years on the men's side, it seems to me that it's a little unfair to compare him with these legends. Apart from the big three plus Andy Murray, how many other players have achieved anything close to what those guys did? Only a handful. You literally could probably count them all on one hand. At the moment, Fritz hasn't made it past the quarterfinal stage at any slam, and he only recently recorded his first win over a top 10 opponent at a Grand Slam at this year's Australian Open, where he beat Stefano Tsitsipas, but at the moment, it's a little too early to conclude that he'll never win a slam. He still is just 26 years old, and like I've said in the past, you only need the stars to align for two weeks to win the majors. With a favorable draw, home crowd support, and good form, it's possible that we see Fritz making deeper runs, particularly at the US Open. Verdict? Slightly disagree. While at the moment it doesn't seem like Fritz is anywhere close to winning a Grand Slam, that could very well change. He has the dedication and hard work to keep improving, so why write him off completely? That being said, you wouldn't be totally wrong if you assumed that I might be a little biased or really optimistic. Having talked about some of the problems and narratives, we also need to talk about the good things about Fritz's game. The first thing that comes to mind is Taylor's serve. Fritz is either in the top 5 or top 10 when it comes to percentage of first serve points won, percentage of second serve points won, service games won, average number of aces per match, and serve rating in general. He ticks most of the boxes, and on his day, even the best players will find it difficult to provide answers to his serve, so we'll need to give him credit for that. Being 6'5 helps for sure, but it is what it is. Is he too reliant on his serve? Well, it's his best shot, so maybe a little. Fritz has worked really hard to get to where he is today. With the help of a star-studded lineup of coaches like Paul Anacone, Michael Russell, and David Nenken, Fritz has been able to make the most out of his ability. Even his average level is a lot better than it used to be, and he's more accepting of his performances nowadays even when they aren't consistent or perfect. Although the 26-year-old couldn't consolidate on the gains he made in 2022, and seeing how his level has dipped in 2023, Fritz will be looking to take advantage of the crowd support during the Sunshine Double to make a statement as the leader of the home charge in the United States states once again. On a side note, Fritz has also just switched his clothing sponsor from Nike to Hugo Boss, and many fans are happy with that move, saying that they want to see something more tailored for Taylor's physique. Fritz can generate lots of power on his backhand, and his shots are flatter and more penetrating. When firing on all cylinders, Fritz's backhand can do a lot of damage to opponents. He has the ability to hit sharp angle cross court on both wings, and really it's a thing of beauty. We could go on and on with the many good things Fritz does, but what many fans really care about are the results at the end of the day. Being mauled by Novak Djokovic nine times in a row with no response, for instance, is something that his fans have had to deal with for quite some time now. Imagine what a win over Novak will do for his confidence. Over the course of his career, Taylor Fritz has had lots of highs and lows, and while we can't really make predictions on how the future will turn out, we know that he's making inroads on improving his game, so deeper runs at slams and more frequent victories against top 10 opponents isn't hard to imagine. If you loved this video, please hit that subscribe button and let us know if you want us to do deep dives on any other player of your choice. Also, I'm super excited to bring you the behind the scenes content we've been shooting from around the WTA Tour over the next few months. It's up close and personal with the players we've been talking about on the channel, and we're thinking about a rebrand to more clearly bring a variety of tennis content your way from around both tours. So if you see a name change, don't worry about it too much, we're just building on the content that we're already doing right now. Meanwhile, if you missed out on this week's recap of the ongoing tournament, be sure to check it out here.